if you ever dreamed of a Raspberry IoT server with backup to Dropbox and secure remote access from everywhere through your own VPN, all based on Docker containers, you have to watch this video. Grüezi YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent, with a new episode and fresh ideas around sensors and microcontrollers. Remember, if you subscribe, you will always sit in the first row. Having a Raspberry Pi as a home server is an excellent addition to our IoT stuff. But setting it up takes a lot of time and know-how. What if we could use the most modern tools to reduce this effort and add some bells and whistles? Let's try it by installing Docker with many containers like Mosquito, Node-RED, Grafana, InfluxDB and others. Increase the life expectancy of your SD card by disabling swapping and by installing lock to ram Automatically backup all valuable data to the cloud or, in our case, to Dropbox. Set up Pi VPN to remotely and securely access our home network from anywhere in the world. Besides that, you will learn a lot of useful things about Docker and containers. Let's start. First, I want to thank Graham from South Africa. He did the heavy lifting on what we will see today. And he created a GitHub repository, including proper documentation for you. I only had to express all my wishes and dreams. My first wish was to use Docker containers on my Raspberry Pi, because this is a modern way of organizing applications. But what is Docker and how does it work? In regular Raspbian, we install applications in the file system. Often, they are complex to install and have many dependencies that all have to be installed too. Especially beginners can get nuts if something goes wrong. And for sure, it takes a ton of time. A better concept is to use so-called containers. As in logistics, they hide what's inside and can easily be transported because the outside is standardized. Docker is the de facto standard for those containers. When we install Docker, we get a Linux add-on, which can handle containers. The containers themselves contain prefabricated applications like Node-RED or InfluxDB. Specialists configure these containers and regularly adapt them to the newest version. We do not have to care too much about that. And the best, you can go to dockerhub.com, search for the containers you need, and Docker automatically downloads them to your Raspberry. Fortunately, the containers only contain what is required. This, by the way, is the main difference to virtual machines, which also include a full operating system and therefore are much larger. Copied to our Raspberry, you can start and stop containers as well as delete them. Let's continue with our wishlist. An IoT server for our lab. As usual, it consists at least of Mosquito, Node-RED, InfluxDB and Grafana. What are the steps to get those containers running? First, we go to Docker Hub and search for Mosquito. We find many containers. Luckily, the first one is an official image, which is good. It was updated one hour ago, so it seems it is well maintained. And it includes versions for many different platforms, including ARM. Perfect. With one click, we get additional information like where the container stores its configuration, data and locks and how to start it. Cool. Unfortunately, these directories are inside the container and you cannot access these files from the outside. Also, if you delete the container, these files are gone and you lost all your valuable data and configurations. We will later see how we can map those directories to our standard file system to keep them outside the containers. This is great because like that we can separate the data which is specific to our installation and therefore valuable from data that is online available. There is no need to back up the publicly available data because we can restore it quickly. We only have to back up our own data which is a fraction of the site of the overall SD card. 
I like this concept a lot because it is a simple and efficient protection against a defective SD card. And later we will see how easy it is to more or less automatically install all standard components. Next, we need node RAID. Here we find no official image. And also the most popular version is deprecated. If we search a little, we get the new version. This is because Node Red recently had a significant update to version 1.0. The new container also contains a version for ARM. Cool. And it uses the well known port 1880. Now we can go on and find the rest of the containers and start them. Not too complicated. But too much work for a lazy guy like me. Fortunately, we have a more elegant way to reach our goal. We can use Docker Compose, which reduces our efforts considerably. And it will even get easier than that. Docker Compose is a framework that contains scripts to commission and start containers automatically. If we look at the Docker Compose file on my Raspberry Pi, we first see all the different containers, here called services. Let's look at Node Red. We find the name we give to the container as well as the name on Docker Hub. Then we see that we want the container to restart if something terrible happens. Also the port mapping is here. So we could map for example the internal port 1880 to a different port outside the container if needed. Lastly we see the volumes. Here we map the internal data directory to a directory outside the container to save our valuable data when the container is deleted. The same thing applies to all other containers. If we execute this YAML file with the simple command docker compose up, all containers are downloaded, installed and started. Completely automatically. But Graham did more for us. He wrote a menu to automate the generation of this YAML file, according to our needs, and he added some additional scripts too. The last few weeks he worked hard to have everything ready for us. All we have to do is to take a new SD card, install Raspbian and do a update. Just the normal stuff. Then we follow his write-up and start downloading the whole project with this command. Now we find all files in the directory IoT stack. When we start menu.sh, we see a selection of containers to choose from. Maybe this will change in the future if Graham decides to add other stuff. First you install Docker. Then you build the YAML file for the stack. You can choose which containers you want to install as well as the additional nodes for node RAID. By the way, Pi-hole creates a hole on your network where all advertising is falling through. Like that, it is no more shown in your browsers. I strongly suggest that you install Portainer as it helps to manage your containers. After this step, our Docker Compose file is created and you can start the whole stack with docker compose up. It takes a while, but we can use the time for a cup of coffee. The time is much faster than the execution of Peter Scargill's script, because containers are already pre-compiled and only have to be copied to our Raspberry. And if we start our stack of containers the next time, docker will not download again and the start is much faster. After a while we can try if the containers started up. Let's connect to Node Red on port 1880. Yes, it works. Of course, it has no flows included. We have to create them or add them using copy paste as shown in video number 255. You can also connect to Portainer on port 9000 or to Grafana on port 3000. But how to connect to InfluxDB? It has no web interface. We have to connect to the terminal inside a container. Fortunately, this is very simple. This command creates a prompt inside the container. And if you type influx, you can look at your databases, etc. 
If you restart menu.sh, you find some of the more common Docker commands. And you also find miscellaneous commands. Here are disable swap and install lock to RAM. Execute them if you want. What are they for? Log files are written continuously to your SD card and so reduce its lifetime. If you install log to RAM, log files are collected in RAM and only written every hour to the SD card. Much better. And if you happen to have a Raspberry Pi 4 with plenty of memory, you will see that even if it does not need the whole memory, it starts to build a swap file. With two undesired effects. One, the swap file often writes to the SD card and the performance of these writes and reads are very slow. And two, it shortens the life of the SD card. So I delete the swap file completely. Make sure you never use more than the built-in memory. Otherwise your Raspberry Pi will block. Now our Raspberry is on a similar level as it was after applying Peter Cargill's script. Only based on the modern container concept. In Graham's description you find the commands to update the containers from time to time. This is the charm of Docker. You always get the newest version when you install them and you easily can update. But of course we want more. We still have two items on the list. Automatic backup and remote access. What happens if your SD card goes sour? You lose everything. Of course, you regularly can create a backup to a second SD card using RPI clone, for example. Not very elegant. My proposal is different. With our containers concept, we strictly separate valuable data from data that quickly can be restored from the internet. Because the valuable data is minimal compared with the size of the whole SD card, we easily can back it up to the cloud. And because Graham put all the valuable data into a directory called volumes, we only need to upload this directory to Dropbox. You can do that as often as you want. You can of course also use Google or another service for that purpose if you know how. Dropbox so far does not support raspberries. But fortunately, Andrea Fabrizi wrote a Dropbox uploader. A link to the write-up on how to install it and customize the uploader is in the description. The important thing is that you need an API key to access your Dropbox, which has to be entered during installation of the uploader. A script that exports the Influx database and saves the volumes directory into your Dropbox is also provided in the scripts folder. You can start it by typing docker underscore backup.sh. But of course, you want that it runs automatically. This is done in crontab. We start it with the command crontab-e and at this line. This starts your backup always at 11 o'clock p.m. Of course, you can also write this line, which starts the backup every hour. Now we can save the changes with Ctrl X and Y. And you can check in your Dropbox if the backup arrives regularly. Now we are safe. In case of an SD crash, we only create a new one using all we learned before. This will take us less than an hour. And then we stop all containers and copy back the volumes folder from Dropbox. If we are happy, also InfluxDB works. If not, we have to delete all databases and restore the backup as shown in Graham's write-up. The last step is the installation of PyVPN. It is straightforward. You find the link to the setup in Graham's GitHub. But how does it work? We need two things. A connection from our PC or smartphone to our Raspberry and encryption of our traffic. Like that, only our devices can connect to our home network and nobody can read what you do. And yes, you heard right. We not only can connect to the one Raspberry, we can connect to all other devices on our home network and even to the whole internet. Like that, you always have a secure connection also if you are connected to a public hotspot. And the internet thinks you sit at home. 
Like that, you can watch all the geo-blocked content of your country, even if you are in a hotel in Timbuktu or in another remote place. But first, we have to overcome a few obstacles. Let's start with the first. How can we connect to our Raspberry, which is safely sitting behind our firewall? Hopefully, nobody can overcome this protection. And anyway, we even do not know the IP address of our home if we do not have a fixed one, which is the typical case for most of us. To find out our IP address, we could enter my IP address on Google. It works as expected. Google's anyway knows everything. But unfortunately, it changes from time to time because our internet provider does not have enough IP addresses for all of us. So we use a trick. We use a free service like DuckDNS. Here we create a subdomain with a fancy name. This domain will always be the same. If we regularly call DuckDNS from our Raspberry, DuckDNS gets our IP address and stores it till the next call. We get this regular call by adding this line to crontab-e. It updates our IP address every 5 minutes. If we now connect to our fancy DuckDNS domain, our traffic is rerouted to our real IP address. Now we have a connection to our home. The first problem nearly is solved, but because we are outside the firewall, nobody lets us in unless we open one port and forward its traffic to our Raspberry. This would be very insecure, but because we install PyVPN on our Raspberry, only our encrypted traffic is accepted on this port. Now the first problem is completely solved and we can go on to find out how we encrypt our traffic. During installation, PyVPN generates a key that has to be transported to the smartphone or PC of your choice. The best is to use a USB stick. The worst, but the most comfortable, as usual, is to send it per email. Now you install this key into your remote device and because it also contains the information about our fancy DuckDNS domain, you only can switch VPN on and you are safely connected to your home network. Like that, I can have a look at the data of my weather station from wherever I am. Or watch the soccer game of my favorite team, which is only available in Switzerland. That's all for today. No summary this time. In the past, I saw that most of you anyway stop whenever I start with a summary. So it's up for discussion, if I should include it also in the future. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, please consider supporting the channel to secure its future existence. You find the links in the description. Thank you. Bye.